Through companies like Uber and Etsy, Silicon Valley has been shaping the wages and working conditions for all sorts of low-wage workers. Now, low-wage workers are attempting to make some rules for Silicon Valley. Palak Shah is Social Innovations Director of the National Domestic Workers Alliance. In addition to helping create the Good Work Code, she's worked in state government for Massachusetts Governor Deval Patrick and in, for the grassroots for the Los Angeles Bus Riders Union, Generation 5, and Oakland Rising in the Bay Area. I'm very glad to welcome Palak Shah to the show. Hi, Palak. Thank you for having me. So let's talk about this Good Work Code. A, why do we need one and, and who's it for? Well, the Good Work Code is a very simple framework of eight values that can guide the creation of good work in the online economy. It's a North Star, a framework of eight principles like safety or transparency or input and inclusion that can guide uh, these new models as they emerge out of Silicon Valley on how the uh, online economy can be a good place to work. Now, for our what's the problem? I mean, we've talked a little bit about the drawbacks of Uber for, organi for, for situations or workplaces or, or industries that have already been organized, taxi workers and so on. Um, but for a lot of the gig workers in Silicon Valley, we're looking at people who might work alone in their home, might be independent and want to be that way. Yeah, no, and I think that that's kind of the promise of the Silicon Valley and the kind of new models that are emerging, right? But at the same time, we want to balance how, do, how does work create stability for workers as well, and that's a core principle of the Good Work Code. I think a lot of um, what we realized at the National Domestic Workers Alliance was that um, our workers, right, nannies, house cleaners, um, caregivers, have been working in kind of informal markets um, and without the kind of traditional protections that most of us take for granted. Mm -hmm. And what we noticed was that as the conversation nationally around the plight of gig workers um, started to grow, we realized there are a lot of similarities to between what gig workers were facing and what domestic workers mm. have been facing for 70 years. And those are things like working without contracts, uh, you know, working without access to benefits or health care, inconsistent hours, a whole host of issues that then contribute to the ability for a domestic worker or any gig worker to kind of make their way in this economy. Tell us a story a, a bit or, or lay it out for us a little bit what it's like to do some of those jobs because there may be people watching that say, well, that sounds kind of fun to work for work for Etsy or, or, or work for another online firm. Yeah, and I think there are, you know, I think these models are emerging and there's a lot of advantages to uh, the flexibility that some of the models are providing, and yet there's a lot of risk. Um, there's a lot of business model decisions that are pushing risk down onto workers, and there are a lot of um, changes in the way that we work, right? In, in the current economy or the offline economy, you go to work and you know who your boss is and it's kind of easy to figure that out. In the age of on-demand and an app-based economy, who actually is your boss and how do you raise the concerns that you have at work? And how do you share your concerns with other workers who you never even meet? Now, and that of isolation of gig workers is actually very structurally similar to the isolation that domestic workers have faced for a long time. And so the Good Work Code, the offering of this eight principle framework on how to make work good is, is essentially um, a, a very simple uh, set of guidelines mm. Uh, so tell us, can you, can you do, do the eight or, or, or give us an example of a, four of them or something? Of course. So <laughs> the first value that's in the Good Work Code is around safety, right? And the real principle behind it is that everyone deserves to be safe at work. One of the things that we started to learn as, we, uh, as some of domestic workers started to engage in these online models is that um, people would often go into situations, right? Domestic workers worked behind closed doors and in other people's homes. And when they were in those situations, because of the particularities of rating systems, right? I mean, if you've taken an Uber or Lyft, you rate your driver. Um, well, there's an interaction between the ratings and the ability, the uh, ability of the workers to get right. access to more work or, or their wages. And so what we started to learn was that there may be unintended consequences of rating systems in keeping people in unsafe situations. And so safety is one example of, of a good work code principle, but right, transparency so is safety, another. Safety, transparency. Transparency is another. This kind of balancing of, of flexibility and stability, right, so that People appreciate the flexibility of schedules, but then how do you actually have a stable enough schedule to be able to predictably earn enough income? So transparency around, will I have a job next week or even tomorrow? And if so, at what time? 
Well, it, and also transparency around the way that work shifts when it's mediated through an app, when work is distributed through code or through text messages on your phone. So how does the algorithm actually work? What keeps you on a platform? What mm. might get you more work? What might get you kicked off a platform? Why are you presenting this good work code right now? Well, I think what's happening right now is there's a real fundamental shift that's happening in the future of work. Um, and I believe that there's a real opportunity to harness the power of new models that are emerging while they're still early in their development and shape the DNA of these models. Um, and the Good Work Code is the kind of framework, right, the set of guidelines that can get these models um, to uh, not just work for the customers and the investors, which is where the most of the focus has been, but for the workers as so well. So I can see the advantage for all of us having a sense of what this code's elements might be. And I encourage people to go and check it out on our website, see all eight points. That's good for us as workers, uh, as well as for employers. But how do you hold anyone accountable um, when the old mechanisms of how you do that through industrial action, strikes, protest, don't really work in the online economy. Well, I think it remains to be seen what will work and what doesn't work. Um, I think, you know, the economy is shifting and so the labor movement and the response of the worker rights movements are going to shift as well. I do think that it is, you know, we're at a point right now where um, the theory of the good work code, right, is to say, can we agree on a shared vision mm -hmm. of where the online economy should be we, going. We, the workers, the employer, That's the right. employers, and the clients. That's right. Customers. And there's both a moral and ethical case for this, of course, right? We represent some of the most vulnerable workers um, in this country. Um, but at the same time, there's a business case for this. These models actually cannot succeed without a reliable, quality um, workforce that can deliver a good service. And so there is a kind of, uh, that presents, I think, an opportunity for the labor movement to really shape the emergence of an industry before it actually gets mm. as big, where it becomes more difficult to shape. Well, you talked about size and coming to scale, and we often talk with small business owners about their desire to have their model come to scale. Uh, but there's also the people who say, yeah, but this system that we have right now, this whole econ economic system is problematic. Uh, wealth tends to, to, to sort of circulate to the top and stick there. Um, things do get super big and hard to, to um, demand transparency or accountability from. Um, is there in what you're doing any possibility of changing our economy? Or, or do you believe as a whole, or do you believe that you can kind of protect us from the worst of it, correct the flaws um, as it is? Well, I think the similarities that we see is that in the same way that domestic work has been the wild west of parts of the economy, there is a kind of wild west nature right now to the emergence of these yeah. online models and the on-demand economy. And that we have an opportunity, it's up to us to shape it. I think the Good Work Code is one strategy that we're advancing to kind of set forth a positive vision and to surface those companies that are actually one, agree with the values mm -hmm. of the Good Work Code and form essentially a center of gravity in Silicon Valley that's saying, no, actually it's possible um, to treat your workers well and it's actually core to the business. And so, we've seen a lot of um, models and companies make recent announcements over the last quarter or so um, articulating that point of view. At the same time, I think the labor movement is going to need to pursue a number of different strategies. Mm -hmm. This is one. Organizing workers is another. There's obviously going to have to be a policy and regulation intervention. But so much is new in this part of the economy, at least as it relates to the technology components of it, that there's some things that will just take some time for us to figure out. On the other hand, there are some things that are exactly the same as they were before, and there's a um, th we know what those issues are, right? It's the same issues that low-wage workers have been facing for, for decades. In all of this discussion, in your view, um, what difference does, does race and, or do race and gender make? Well, I think it's a complicated question, and I don't think we know enough about all of the various unattended and intended consequences of the new models that are emerging. What we do know, at least from the point of view of our workers, is that um, a large number of our workers are immigrant women or people who are monolingual Spanish speakers, and that if we want to build an inclusive economy, which I do think there is a shared vision right now around, 
if we want to build an inclusive economy, there are subtle tweaks to operations, right, that are kind of outlined in the Good Work Code that will take us one step further to building an economy that's inclusive of people who don't speak English or people who um, may not have as much access to job opportunities. Palak, thank you so much for joining us. Is there a way that people can get more information about the Good Work Code and maybe bring it to the attention of the people they work with or for? Yeah, so there's a website. Our website is www.goodworkcode.org. And on that website, you can see the 12 companies who've already signed on and committed to the principles of the Good Work Code and um, what they're planning on doing. Thanks so much. Thank you. You can get more information about the Good Work Code and more at our website.